Welcome! Today is the 8th day of Tammuz, the 14th of July. That's Bastille Day for those in France. And we're starting a new Parsha, one of the most interesting Parshot in the entire Torah. Its name is Balak, it's the 40th Parsha from the beginning. And the sages have something incredible to say about this Parsha. They tell us that in Bhava Batra, in the tractate Bhava Batra 12b, they tell us that Moses wrote three books. The first book he wrote is obviously the Pentateuch. We call it the five books of Moses. The first book in the Pentateuch, Bereshi, Genesis, was traditional in the time of Moses, meaning that he received it from previous generations, and then he edited it based on how God told him to edit it, to, to transform it into part of the Torah. But the contents were already passed down for a few hundred years because these are the stories of the patriarchs. The second book that he wrote is Job. And that's very interesting because we might not think that Job is from Moses, but Job is from the time of Moses. We know... Um, First of all, there's a lot of, a great deal of linguistic similarity between the book of Job and the five books of the Torah. It's more archaic Hebrew. But what's even more important than that is that we know that Job was one of the advisors to Pharaoh when Moses was in Egypt, the time that he was in Egypt. He was one of the three advisors that told Paro what to do with the Israelites that were then in the land of Egypt. And Job did not want to take part in it, and he fled. But that's a topic for another time. Maybe we'll mention something a little bit more about that, maybe today, but probably won't have enough time for it. The third book he wrote, and it's very interesting that the sages call this a book, is this Parsha, the Parsha of Balak, which is really the story of Balaam, the non-Israelite uh, prophet of the ancient times, who the sages say is equal in stature to Moses. And it's very important for the sages that there was a prophet able to prophesy at Moses' stature, because they say the nations of the world could have come and claimed that if you would have given us prophets, God, we would not have gone astray. So God did give them prophets, specifically Balaam and his father Beor. These were actually referenced in last week's Parsha, where we talked about al ken Mua Moshlim, Therefore, those who, makes, who make parables or who make poetry, similes, um, some kind of story, like a metaphor, they're mentioned there. And Rashi says right away that he's talking about the two prophets who in the time of the Bible were called Moshlim, those who make parables, or poets in a certain sense. There's a lot to be discussed about the connection between prophecy and poetry. In fact, the entire Torah is called a shira. Kitvu lachem, vata kitvu lachem ta shira azot. Now write down this poem. The entire Torah is called a poem because Moses in the end is a poet. And there's a lot of things that we can see in the Torah that may turn it into poetry rather than just being prose. One of the main things I think that uh, at least strike my fancy about this is that poetry uses the word and a lot at the beginning of a sentence. And there's almost, I think, 50 or 60 percent of the verses in the Torah that begin with the vav, which can be a conjunctive letter serving as an and. And you can see that going again and again. And there are also specifically three poems that we talked about last week in the Torah itself. But what do we want to do with this? We want to say that First of all, this is very striking. The Moses wrote three things. Why would, why would the sages say that he wrote Job? Well, because he's not there. 
He heard this story somewhere, maybe from Job himself in the time that he was in the palace and growing up by Pharaoh's daughter. It could be that he met Job and he heard it from him himself, from first, uh, from first source. It could be that he heard the story later on. And then he wrote it as a cautionary tale about what it means to serve God in the way that Job was hoping to. We've talked about this uh, in the past, I believe, a few times. But Job was very lopsided in his service of God. It was all out of fear. There was no love of God. Everything he did, he did out of fear. And in the end, God does reward him. And the big uh, transformation happens at the end where he receives everything he had back and twicefold and so on. But it's sort of like a cautionary tale about trying to understand, to say that I can rationally understand how God works, how he thinks, what his reasons for doing what he does, and that doesn't work very well. But why Balaam? Why this Parsha of Balak? Well, obviously, because Moses, Moses is not there. He's not a player in any of this. He's not, he's not present. He may have heard it, but it stands to reason that the fact that he put it into the Torah means that he heard it from God. He heard from God this account of what happened with Balaam. And the moment that we have three books, and this is from the sages, again, this is their language, they say Moses wrote three books, this immediately connects us, uh, this is an associative type of thinking in the Talmud, it immediately connects us with the three books that open on Rosh Hashanah. The sages say on Rosh Hashanah of every year, the first day of the year, God opens three books, the book of the righteous, the book of the intermediates, and the book of the wicked. Now, without getting into what happens on Rosh Hashanah, obviously those who are righteous are written in the Book of the Righteous and so on. But without getting into that, the parallel is striking. The Book of the Righteous is obviously Moses' book of the Torah, the five books of Moses. That's obviously the Book of the Righteous. The Book of the Intermediates is Job. Job is definitely an intermediate. He's an archetype for what it means to be an intermediate someone who is wrestling with his evil inclination, who is wrestling and trying to prevent himself from doing something wrong, and he's even like the intermediate in the Tanya, he's a person who's never done anything wrong, but he fails to see that he is actually under the sovereignty still of his evil inclination, even though he behaviorally is able to control it. We're not going to talk about Job, like we said, anymore today. What we're going to focus on is Balaam. And Balaam's story here is the book of the wicked. What is Balaam? Why is Balaam wicked? Well, that's not such a big question. Balaam, on the one hand, says, I can't say anything except what God puts in my mouth. On the other hand, he does agree to go with the messengers, the emissaries of Balak, the king of Moab at the time, and he decides that he's going to find an opportunity, sort of when God is not looking, but more to the point when God is angry anyway. There is a certain point in every day that God has anger on the world. He says, and I'll, I know when that moment is, and even though in general God told me not to curse the Israelites, I will find that moment and I will use it to curse them. But, in spite of the fact that there is such a moment every day, God didn't let him do it, and he transformed the curses into blessings. And all that Balaam could get out in his prophecies were blessings. Now, in case you might think that maybe Balaam is a very positive guy in general, maybe he just uh, got a bad rap here. Balaam is one of the only figures from this early period of the Bible, whom we have external corroboration about from other sources. He's one of the only ones that is mentioned by name, Balaam ben Beor, exactly the way he is called here. And I want to read to you just a little bit out of this. Uh, you can look at it, you can look it up on Wikipedia. It's called the Der Allah Inscription. And I'll just read a few things about it. It's an inscription discovered 
1967 in Deir Ala, Jordan. It is currently at the Jordan Archaeological Museum. It is written in a, in a peculiar Northwest Semitic dialect and has provoked much debate among scholars and had a strong impact on the study of Canaanite and Aramaic inscriptions. The exca excavation revealed a multiple chamber structure that had been destroyed by an earthquake during the Persian period. So we're talking about about 500 BCE. That's when it was destroyed. And the, and the wall of which was written a story relating to visions of Balaam, son of Beor, a seer of the gods. And he's the same Balaam that we have in our Parsha. And the inscription, again, is, is dated to about 800 BCE. But from the language, it's clear that this is the retelling of a story that's a few hundred years old, at least a few hundred years old. So the story is, is probably from the time of Balaam himself. And there have been a, a number of translations of this uh, inscription. The most recent one was done in 2013, I believe. Sorry, 2003. And I'll just read a little bit of it for you so you can get an impression of what Balaam is like. The misfortunes of the book of Balaam, son of Beor, a divine seer was he. The gods came to him at night, and he beheld a vision in accordance with El's, we say this Kel, with God's utterance. It, Moabites spoke a language that is almost identical to Hebrew, it's very, very close. They said to Balaam, son of Beor, so will it be done with not surviving. No one has seen the likes of what you have heard. Balaam arose on the morrow. He summoned the heads of the assembly to him, and for two days he fasted and wept bitterly. Then his intimates entered into his presence, and they said to Balaam, son of Beor, why do you fast and why do you weep? Then he said to them, be seated, and I will relate to you what the Shakai gods have plans, and go see the acts of God. The gods have banded together, the Shakai gods have established a council, and they have said to the goddess Shagar, so up, close, close up the heavens with dense cloud, that darkness exists there, not brilliance, obscurity and not clarity, so that you instill dread in dense darkness, and never utter a sound again. It shall be that swift and crane will shriek insult to the eagle, and a nest of vultures shall cry out in response. The stork, the young of the falcon, and the owl, the chicks of the heron, sparrow, and cluster of eagles, pigeons and birds in the sky, and a rod shall flay the cattle. Where there are ewes, a staff shall be brought, hares eat together freely. And there's all this description of death and destruction that is going to befall the kingdom of Moab in his time. And this is actually very similar. It's not so different from what he talks about at the end of our Parsha. So he was really a very negative figure, and that's the idea here, that when God did give prophecy, and prophecy, again, I, I, I'll talk about it at some other point, what the connection between prophecy and poetry is, but when God did give prophecy to someone like Balak, it was inevitably negative. And the whole point of Moses bringing down this story is because the curses became blessings. That is the major lesson, that's the message that Moses gave us by bringing this story down. That the whole point of the Torah, the whole point of Judaism, the whole point of being connected to God is to take even that which is negative in the world, those things that are curses, and to transform them into blessings. It says even in the Tikkun Zohar, sorry, in the Zohar itself, it says that the value of Moses, which is 345 in Hebrew, Moshe, is equal to Mikre, which means by chance. Moses is the ultimate transformer in reality. His prophecy is always one of taking that which seems like a curse and turning it into something that is a blessing. And that really, as we'll see as we go on this week, God willing, is a lot of the motif that will be repeated again and again in this week's Parsha, of being able to take something which on the face of it can be destructive, can be negative, and being able to turn it into something positive, to turn it into a blessing. And that is the crux, the essence of what the Torah comes to do in the world, it comes to churn that which is negative in our lives and in, in our surroundings, most importantly, in the lives of others around us. When a person is truly full of Torah, he can hear things 
and he can transform them in his mind and teach them anew to the person who's experiencing them and transform the cursing, the curses into a blessing. And that's what we say actually on Rosh Hashanah and on Yom Kippur. We ask, we beseech God to churn the bl- curses. And God forbid, if there's any kind of negative decree, to transform it into a blessing. And the source of this is this parsha, parsha Balak, where Balaam's curses, and that was his general attitude, are turned into a blessing despite everything that he tried to do. So with this, we'll end today our first uh, short teaching for this week. Hope to see you during the rest of the week. Bye-bye.